It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Natalie Panic. Natalie is an engineer at MDA's Robotics and Automation Division, working on Canadian space robotics and other space exploration programs. Throughout her career, which included internships at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and NASA's Ames Research Center, Natalie has continued to encourage women to pursue challenging careers in typically male-dominated fields. Natalie is the 2013 recipient of the University of Calgary's Graduate of the Last Decade Award and the Northern Lights Award Foundation's 2013 Rising Star in Aerospace. She was named one of CBC's 12 Young Leaders Changing Canada. Canada's Financial Post describes Natalie as a vocal advocate for women in technology. Natalie also joins an elite group of women as one of WXN's 2014 Top 100 Award winners and one of Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2015. So please join me in welcoming Natalie to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing? Good. I think you can do a bit better. <laughs> So I, for one, am actually glad I'm not speaking after the Prime Minister, because that would be super intimidating. Phew. So uh, during my talk, you can tweet me at Twitter if you want to start a conversation and check out my blog. There's lots of information online there. So just to get started, I'm curious if anyone in here wants to be an astronaut. You can just raise your hand. All right, there's a couple of you. So that was a dream that I had when I was about your age, and it's still a dream that I have today. So I want to see Earth from a different perspective. I want to explore space, the unknown, and discover what's out there. And this lifelong dream of traveling to space has led me to some really cool opportunities. So I pursued a mechanical engineering degree at the University of Calgary, then on to a master's degree in aerospace engineering, and that has led me to where I am today, working at an aerospace company on space robotics. Now, one of the most common and iconic phrases in the aerospace industry is the right stuff. And the right stuff was a phrase that was coined to describe early Air Force and Navy test pilots who were flying experimental aircraft in the late 50s and early 60s, and also to describe the first manned uh, space missions, the astronauts who were flying and trying to get to the moon. And the right stuff was this perfect mix of courage and passion and charisma and fearlessness and risk taking. And while not all of us will become test pilots or astronauts, I believe that we all have the right stuff. It's just a matter of tapping into some foundations for success and pursuing your dreams. So today I want to share some stories of the projects that I've worked on, as well as some of my lessons learned, and hopefully get you excited about pursuing a career in STEM. And I want to start off with a story about perseverance. So I'm actually from Calgary, where the major industry there is oil and gas. There aren't a lot of opportunities to pursue aerospace engineering or space exploration. So I was constantly online looking for opportunities where I could get aerospace experience or maybe land an internship position. And I came across something called a Space Exploration Scholarship. This was an opportunity for one Canadian student to go down and intern at NASA for three months during the summer. And as soon as I saw this, I knew I had to apply. When I saw this opportunity, I was early in my engineering degree, and because they were only selecting one Canadian, I figured I probably didn't have a good shot, but I put my application together anyway, sent it off. And then a few months later, I waited for the email response from NASA. And when I opened it, it said, thank you for taking the time to apply. But unfortunately, you have not been selected for the program. I was realistic in my expectations, so I figured I probably wasn't going to get it, and life goes on. So a year goes by in my engineering degree, and I get a notification reminding me to apply for the program again. So I put together my application, write my essays about why I really want to work in space, and send it off. Same as the year before, a couple of months go by, and then I get that email from NASA. And when I opened it, it said, thank you for taking the time to apply, but unfortunately, you have not been selected for this opportunity. I was a little bit more devastated this time because I had been rejected once before, but again, life goes on. I was getting really into my studies, doing some hands-on projects, and so went back into life as I knew it. A year went by again, and I got a third reminder email. And I thought, you know what? Maybe third time's the charm. I'm going to apply for this program. So I updated my application, got some new reference letters, fired it off to NASA. 
Couple months go by and I get another email from NASA. And guess what? When I opened it this time, it said, thank you for taking the time to apply, but unfortunately you have not been selected for the program. <laughs> so now I'm really starting to doubt my abilities to go into the aerospace uh, industry. I'm wondering if I just don't have what it takes and I don't know what to do. Ultimately, I was applying for grad school, so I went back to my routine, finished my engineering degree at the University of Calgary, and then went on to doing a master's at the University of Toronto. And for the fourth time, I got this reminder email from NASA saying that I could apply for this program. This was the last year I was eligible to apply, and I kind of debated whether I wanted to do it because I didn't know if I wanted to be rejected another time. I, don't, I didn't know if I could handle it. But ultimately, I decided to put my application together again. I updated my essays for a fourth time, and I thought, maybe they'll just feel sorry for me and accept me into the program. So I sent it off, waited the few months, got that same email from NASA, and then guess what it said this time after four tries? Thank you for taking the time to apply, but unfortunately you have not been selected for the program. I was completely devastated, and I remember going out for a run. And I came up with this wild idea that I should just call the number at the bottom of the email, which was a direct line to the chief of the Office of Higher Education at NASA, and ask him for feedback on my application. I figured I was going to get a voicemail or machine, so I had my whole message prepared that I was going to leave. But when I dialed the number, someone picked up on the other end. And within two minutes of that phone call, I had an internship position offered to me on the spot. So it just goes to show the power of perseverance and creating your own opportunities and keeping on, keeping on, working towards your dream, even when you get rejected one, two, three, four times. And for the longest time, I was embarrassed to tell the story because I felt like I was a failure. But I told it to a group of women your age, and they were so appreciative that I had shared an experience where I had worked so hard to get to my dreams, because often we only hear about the success stories of people. And for every hour that I spent down at NASA, I spent 10 times as long trying to get myself there. And that made it so much more worthwhile in so many ways. So this is actually one of the clean rooms down at NASA Goddard. I felt like I was in my element. I was surrounded by people working on actual space hardware. This is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can see that shiny metal box behind all the white people in their uh, suits. And that is actually orbiting around the sun right now, sending back data. <laughs> A clean room is an area where you have to keep it really clean, exactly how it sounds, because you're building electronics and mechanical, mechanical equipment that needs to function in space, so you keep it very clean in one of these rooms. This is one of the biggest clean rooms in the world. This is the high bay where the astronauts actually trained for repairing the Hubble Space Telescope. You guys have all heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, I'm assuming. So it's sending back beautiful images of space. And when they launched it into space, there was actually an issue with one of its mirrors. So they immediately had to do manned servicing missions to make it functional again, because they had spent millions of dollars launching this telescope into outer space. And then sometimes you get to do really cool things like skydive with Korea's first astronaut, who is a woman, by the way. So one thing I would encourage you to do is also share your stories where you've persevered, because you might just ignite a spark in one of your friends or someone that you know to persevere towards their dreams, and that can make a really big difference. So perseverance has actually taught me a lot about embracing failure, not just on a personal level, but also when you're working on really complicated projects and hardware that you're building to do cool things. And one of my greatest experiences with this was building a solar-powered car. So when I was in university, I decided to get some hands-on experience by joining an extracurricular team, which was the University of Calgary solar-powered car team. This was an opportunity to build a car powered solely by the sun and then race it across North America. So what was really interesting about this project is that it was exactly like a real world engineering project while I was in university. So usually when you're on an engineering team, you go through a life cycle of a project, which starts off with the brainstorming concept development phase, moves to the analysis and doing the math to prove your design works, then you get into the actual building of the hardware and testing it to prove that it works, and then using it in the application that it was designed for. So this is one of our very initial concepts of our solar-powered car. 
we had come up with an idea that it would be shaped like an airplane wing because we needed it to be really aerodynamic for this race. And then we started running what we call computational fluid dynamics, so trying to visualize the flow of air over the car to try and minimize drag on it. This is what the inside of our car looks like. I'm just going to go ahead one slide. Is there a laser pointer? Oh, there is, sweet. So this is the final project, our final product of our car. You can see all these black squares on the top. They're the solar cells. So they're about the size of a piece of bread, and that's what's converting energy from the sun into electricity to power our car. So if you took that top shell off, this is what the car looks like on the inside. So you have the chassis, which is like the skeleton of the car, you have the wheels, which are rolling on the road, and then this box at the front is the battery pack, where you have the lithium-ion batteries, which are very similar to the batteries that you use in your cell phone. So the idea was to build this solar car and then race it in the North American Solar Challenge. So this was a race that went from Austin, Texas, north to Winnipeg, and then west back to Calgary. This was the first time that the race was finishing in Canada, and they wanted to finish at our university. And our president at the time said, well, we can't just have our students waving the checkered flag at the finish line. We need to enter a car in the race. The crazy part about this is that most teams have two years to design their car. They have a legacy of cars before them, that they've done this before. They have resources in place, mentors to look up to, to ask questions to, and they have money and funding. We had nine months to build our car. We had never done it before. We had no money, and we had no idea what we were doing. So it was trial and error for the entire nine months, trying to do something, realizing it didn't work, and then trying to transform that failure into a success so that we could get our car onto the road. So once you've designed your solar-powered car, you've come up with a concept, you think it's good to go, you have to get it approved by the race official. So you send all of your designs, all of your data off to the race team, they'll examine it and decide if it's safe for the road. If they've decided it's safe for the road, you get to bring your car to Texas and then go through what's called a scrutineering and qualifying phase. So that means that the race officials are examining all the physical aspects of your car to make sure it's safe on the highways because we're actually driving these cars with transport trucks and other vehicles at 100 kilometers per hour on the interstates and the Trans-Canada Highway. So it has to be safe. So just like a normal car, it would have turn signals, a rear view mirror, a seat belt for the driver, everything that a normal car would have, these experimental cars also had to have. And for the nine months that I worked on this team, we learned the ins and outs of teamwork, the frustration that can develop when teams are overworked and success isn't immediate, but also that feeling of pure joy when something does work and you get this really cool car on the highway and people are so excited to see what a team of university students can accomplish with some really cool technology. So, this is what our car looks from the back. It's a three-wheeled car versus a four-wheeled car because we wanted it to be lighter. We wanted to eliminate the extra mass of a wheel because, again, the ultimate goal was to win the race, which means you want to go as fast as possible. And then this is one of my favorite pictures I like to show because not many people can say they cross the border between two countries in an experimental test vehicle with the customs agents knocking on that little <laughs> bubble window asking for your passport. <laughs> And then at the end of the day, um, when you're racing the cars, you race for eight hours at a time. So you start at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then you go until about 6 p.m. in the afternoon. And I was racing a stint on our third day of the race. It's a 10-day race from um, our checkpoint in the morning, which was Oklahoma. And when I was racing in the car, you can tell if I go back a few slides, you're pretty much lying down on your back, and then you kind of had to have an angle just under your head so I can see out of that bubble. And you know when you're driving on the highway and you have the pavement lines that are running across it and it can make your ride really bumpy? I was going over these pavement lines for hours and hours, and my ride was getting extremely rough in the car. And you can see in that picture that I also have a microphone because I'm speaking to a vehicle that's following behind me and I'm relaying them information from inside of the car so that they can strategize and plan how fast to go. And I'm relaying to them that it doesn't really feel right in the car, that maybe we should pull over and see if anything's wrong because it's a really bumpy ride and it's getting really loud in the car. And the strategist decided that they wanted to make good time on this day, that we were going to keep going and push the vehicle as far as we could. 
When we stopped at six o'clock at the end of the day and we removed this top shell of our car, the back chassis that's kind of underneath my back here had completely cracked in half. And every team has a race official that's traveling with them. So when they saw this crack in the car, immediately they said that we were no longer fit to race. We wouldn't be able to complete the race. Luckily, we had stopped next to a barn with an older couple who had never seen anything like this. And they were so excited about what we were doing that they decided to let us use their barn overnight to try and repair our car. We spent the next 12 hours welding our chassis back together. And I think it's because we had spent those nine months embracing failure, learning how technology fails to understand how it works, that in the heat of the moment, we were able to improvise and make decisions that allowed us to get back on the road again. And ultimately, that allowed us to cross the finish line, in Calgary with 10,000 people who came out to cheer us on to see these alternative energy cars pushing the limits of solar powered energy, which is pretty fantastic. So a lot of my experiences that I've had have been ones where I'm outside of my comfort zone. When I joined the solar powered car team, I wasn't really sure what I was getting into. I didn't have a lot of hands-on experience and I was scared and intimidated and that's perfectly okay. And I found myself in a similar situation with my first job, which is where I am now at a company called MDA Building Space Robotics. So I had gone through engineering degrees, done the solar powered car. My master's degree was combustion and microgravity, which had nothing to do with robotics. And somehow I ended up with this job at a robotics company. And I completely felt out of my element from the get go. So just for some context, MDA is the company that built the Canada Arms. So Canada Arm flew on the space shuttle. It was used to deploy satellites and other payloads into space, and that arm is currently retired. Canada Arm 2 is on the International Space Station right now. It's fundamental, it was fundamental in building the International Space Station. And if you ever get your hands on a new $5 bill, take a look at it because we have that technology on our money, which is pretty cool. So the project that I was hired into was a satellite servicing project. So we were trying to repair and recycle satellites that are in orbit. How many of you have used a cell phone today? You can just raise your hand. Okay, almost everybody. How many of you have checked the weather in the last week? How many of you have flew in an airplane in the last few months? Most of you. How many of you watch TV? <laughs> all right, so all of the things that I'm naming and almost everything else in our everyday lives relies on satellites that are orbiting around the Earth. But satellites are only built to last for a certain lifetime, maybe 20, 25 years. And at the end of a satellite's life, if it runs out of propellant or if a part breaks down any time in that 25 year lifespan, there's nothing that can be done to fix that satellite. It just ends up staying in its orbit in outer space. It might eventually deorbit back into the atmosphere and burn up in 20 to 25 years. And there's an opportunity, potentially, if there's enough propellant left, to move that satellite into a graveyard orbit, which is like moving a broken down car into a shoulder lane. So you're not really doing anything about it, you're just moving it out of the way temporarily. So this is an artist's uh, image of what all the debris and junk orbiting around the Earth looks like, which is pretty crazy. And you can imagine that as we continue on our path of being more dependent on technology and all the conveniences that I asked you about a few minutes ago, this congestion is only going to increase in orbit. So the idea was to build a robotic arm that could repair and refuel satellites in orbit. So this arm would fundamentally do what you or I or your parents or anyone else does to refuel fuel on a car or do an oil change or change tires. So to kind of give you an idea of how this arm works, can I get everyone to stick out an arm, either your right or left arm? So on our arms, we have a shoulder, we have an elbow, and we have a wrist. This robot also has a shoulder, an elbow, and a wrist. So the shoulder's kind of hidden here. This is its elbow, and this is its wrist. So keep your arms out. At your shoulder, you can pitch your arm up and down. You can also yaw it right or left. At your elbow, you can pitch up and down, and you can also roll. And then at your wrist, you can pitch, yaw, and roll. So this robot does exactly the same thing as the arms that you just moved around, which is pretty amazing that we're transferring that capability of a human arm into something that's working in outer space. Now, if we wanted to type on our phone or grab a jar of peanut butter, we use our hands because they can do dexterous tasks. 
this robot doesn't have a hand, but it has something we call an end effector, which is this big piece of metal here, and it's grabbing onto tools that are going to pump propellant from like a tow truck spacecraft along these hoses into the spacecraft that's broken down, or it can do things like cut wires on valves and other really cool capabilities that you would need to make a satellite functional again. So when I was hired into this project, I was hired as an operations engineer. So that meant I was taking 3D models of all these parts that you've seen in these pictures and rehearsing the entire mission on my computer before we actually did it in outer space. And I was the only operations engineer on this program at the time. And I remember a month into my job, we were having our first big review with our customer. And because I was the only operations engineer in this role, my boss asked me if I could give a presentation about what I was working on. And I was really scared because I was new to this company, I was new to this kind of work, and I really didn't want to make a mistake in front of the customer and in front of my colleagues. So I gave my presentation, went through it in about 20 minutes, and then at the end of my presentation, one of our customers asked a question. And I kind of froze for a second because I didn't know the answer. And then all I did was say I didn't know. And then a colleague of mine stepped in and answered the question, and life went on. And I know that's a really simple exa example, but it's such a good example of being okay with admitting that you don't know something, that you put yourself in a situation outside of your comfort zone because you want to learn and because you're surrounded by a team of experts who can teach you things you do not know. And that's one of the most valuable aspects of working outside of your comfort zone. Moving outside of your comfort circle is also a lifelong process. So the way I think about it is you step outside of your comfort zone, where you're not the expert. You're at a low level surrounded by people who are going to teach you things. And then as you grow through that position, you learn and you improve and you start to become the expert, which slowly moves you back into your comfort zone. And when you get back in your comfort zone, you just have to step right out again. It's the cyclical process that enables lifelong learning. And that is absolutely fascinating that we have opportunities to do that and to better ourselves in our career as we go forward. This is an image of what one of the satellites would look like if it was looking through the cameras that we have on a robotic arm. And what's really neat is that these robots would be controlled by someone on Earth doing really crazy complex tasks in space, which to me is pretty fascinating. And then now I'm working on a Mars rover program. So we're building the chassis and locomotion system for the European Space Agency's 2018 ExoMars rover. That basically means we're building all this bottom structure with the wheels, anything that's going to allow the rover to move. And again, this is an opportunity that's outside of my comfort zone, but sometimes you just have to dive right in, embrace the challenge, and see how you can push your limits and your capabilities. Of course, nothing that I've done or that I've talked about today would be possible without mentorship, without people who are my champions pushing me, encourage me to pursue new opportunities or things that I didn't think I was capable of. Sometimes your mentors come naturally. They could be your supervisors or your bosses at your job. Or sometimes you have to actually reach out to people who inspire you. I encourage you, if there's someone that you look up to or that you think is doing really cool things, send them an email. Just ask them if you can ask them what their uh, path has been, what they studied in school, what scholarships they got. It's really cool to have someone that you can get one-on-one -on -one feedback from instead of having to Google online and try and find the answers. Looking back when I was growing up, I was constantly on Google. just trying to figure out what to do to become an astronaut, and it was really hard. I wish I could have just had a scientist or an astronaut that I could have emailed in person and asked for the feedback from. And oftentimes, mentorship comes from afar. They can be heroes or role models that you see in the public eye or that are in the media. One of the things I'm very passionate about is trying to get more women in STEM visible in the media, because you can't be what you can't see. And to prove that point, I want to do a little bit of an experiment with you guys. And I do it at almost every talk that I give. So I need everyone in the audience to stand. Awesome. I'm going to say a name. If you recognize the name that I say, I want you to stay standing. If you don't know the name of the person I say, I want you to take a seat. OK, so stand if you know, sit if you don't. Kim Kardashian. Okay, so I think everyone in the room is standing. <laughs> Honey Boo Boo. 
Okay, so I think almost everyone in the room is still standing. You guys can look around and see what the room looks like as we go through this. What about Marissa Meyer? Okay, so Marissa is the CEO of Yahoo, one of the youngest women on the Fortune 500, and she's really in the news a lot. What about Zaya Tong? Oh, yeah, we have one standing. So, Zaya Tong is, you, you can sit now. <laughs> Zaya Tong is a co host on uh, Daily Planet, which is one of Discovery Channel's longest running science shows. What about Cara Santa Maria? No, she's a neuroscientist and hosts a very popular podcast called Talk Nerdy and hosts a number of science related television shows. What about Jesse Combs? No? Jessie Combs is one of the coolest women I've had the privilege of meeting. She is a custom car fabricator, a welder, she hosts a number of shows on TV like All Girls Garage and she did a stint on Overhaulin and she also has a world record as the fastest woman on four wheels for setting uh, a record in a rocket car in the desert. So. When you look around the room, you see that everybody knows the reality TV stars and nobody knows the amazing women who are doing incredible things in science, technology and engineering and math and who are going to change the world because of their vision and their innovation. And I know that a lot of the times we don't have a choice what the media puts on TV, but we have a choice about what we consume and what we look to and what we watch on TV. The women that I named off who are in science and technology and engineering and math are in the media. They are out there and they're accessible to us. So I have one ask of you today, and that is to Google one of those women that I named that you didn't know, and learn about them, see what they're working on. And if you don't remember them, we can set up emails or figure out a way that we can make those uh, names accessible to you so that you can go kind of expand your field of view and, and see the really amazing women who are out there doing incredible things in the science and tech fields. Now at the end of the day, I know that not everyone is going to go into science and tech, and that's perfectly okay, but by having these conversations and these type of events, we're inspiring science literacy in the public and encouraging young people like yourselves to think critically about the world we live in and to be able to validate information that's presented to us. That's incredibly valuable, and that is how all of us, especially you in the audience, are going to change the world. So thank you very much for having me today. Questions are good. <laughs> Don't be shy. Has everyone in here done this event before? Is this first time for people? First time? Yeah? All right. Well, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, so how, how far away do you think you are from your dream of becoming an astronaut? Have you applied ever to become an astronaut? So really good questions. I applied in 2009, but I was still in school. I wasn't eligible at the time, but I did it anyway, just because why not? Our, the, Can, the Canadian space program is actually kind of small. So right now we only actually have two active astronauts who are both men and they likely won't fly until 2019 and 2024. So this for me is really a long-term goal. And because it's led me to so many cool experiences, it's really icing on the cake if I get there. It keeps driving me to do situations and projects outside of my comfort zone and to challenge myself. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm sitting right beside the microphone, so I should ask a question. Can you explain to the audience what you actually have to do to be an astronaut, what you should prepare for, what kind of subjects you should be taking. I personally don't really know what the background is, so I'd be interested myself. Sure. So usually a space agency, when they need astronauts, will put out a call, and then it's an online application process. Usually you need a PhD or the equivalent work experience, so about three years. A lot of the astronauts have pilot's licenses, they have um, scuba diving capabilities, they're just really well-rounded individuals. There's no one set path to be an astronaut, which makes it really interesting because you're kind of just pursuing different paths and I'm hoping that the experiences that I've had will one day help me get there. 
Any questions from the girls? If you don't want to come up to the mic, you can yes. raise your hand too. Go oh, there one. we go, we've got one. <laughs> what exactly would you like to do as an astronaut, like work on the International Space Station, and like go explore other planets? So right now, the astronauts uh, typically would go to the International Space Station and do science. Something like going to Mars is kind of a long-term thing, so maybe one of you girls in the audience will be the first to set foot on Mars. Uh, yep, go ahead. I'll just repeat the question. Sure. It was what inspired you to do what you do? Uh, for me, because I'm from Calgary and growing up in the Rockies, I spent a lot of time outside camping and hiking, and I think that love of adventure and exploration on Earth it translated into wanting to go to space. And then I also watched a lot of Star Trek and Stargate SG-1 <laughs> with my mom growing up, and so on the show Stargate, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but there's a female lead character named Samantha Carter who's an astrophysicist, and she was this super cool, intelligent woman who for me was a weekly reminder that women can thrive and succeed in the sciences. Um, what are some of the struggles you think that women face when pursuing a career in science that like, Maybe men don't experience. Um, probably self-doubt is a big one. Feeling like you're not good enough, you don't have the capabilities. Um, I touched on being scared and intimidated where you get in a situation outside of your comfort zone. I think that can really hold people back. But if you're willing to just get over that initial bit of discomfort, the rewards beyond that of doing hands-on experience and building things and experimenting and tinkering is really amazing. the most interesting project you got to work on throughout your career? All of them. <laughs> One of the cool things I did while I was at NASA was a mission to Mars where we were looking at if a crew could live under the surface because Mars actually has a network of lava tubes and caves. How many of you have seen The Martian? Some of you? So for those who haven't and those uh, who have, Matt Damon lives on the surface in a habitat and we thought it would be cool if you could put that habitat under the surface which would protect the crew from like volatile dust storms and crazy radiation. That was pretty neat. Well, one more question. Um, so when did you know that that was what you wanted to pursue? I was probably about your age. That, that's when I had this idea that it would be so cool to be an astronaut. But to be honest, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to figure out what path I'm going down. And I think sometimes people think they have to have that one goal and they can't deviate from it. But in life, you're often pulled down different paths. And there's no wrong path. There's just different paths with stories to tell that excite you and that interest you. All right. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you.